think about who you're selling to, not what you're selling, and focus on, on the customer, what's in it for them, and how they want to buy. This is Outside Sales Talk, the best podcast for outside salespeople. I'm your host, Steve Benson, and we're here to chat with the world's top sales experts so that you can get their best sales tactics to level up your game. Welcome back to Outside Sales Talk. Today, we're going to talk about how to sell more with a buyer-focused sales funnel. And I've got Peter Strokorb with us right now today. Welcome to the show, Peter. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks for having me on your program. And Peter is the founder and principal at um, the Peter Strokorb Advisory. And Peter has 10 years of experience, starting with managing several startups um, and then also about 20 plus more years in the corporate sector. Yeah. Today, uh, Peter shows sales and business leaders how they can accelerate their sales. And this, uh, the buyer-focused sales funnel is, is, a, is definitely a topic that I've heard you speak about before. And I'm really ex- excited to have you on the show so you can share, that with the, share all this with our listeners. This is fantastic. Thanks, Dave. Love to. Well, first question, um, I, I guess first tell me, how has sales changed in the last few years? Okay, well, look, the, uh, the pandemic has been a catalyst for change. I think the change has been coming for a long time, but, uh, but the, the, the catalyst that made it finally happen was the, the pandemic when, when everybody hunkered down and had other things in their mind than buying things and, and sales became a lot more difficult for, for people to execute. So basically what I'm saying is that um, in 2018 and 19, you might have gotten away with um, spamming a thousand people in the hope that two will be interested and then you, you, you close your deals. And, and it was a numbers game in the sense that the more leads we put into the top of the funnel, then the more deals will come out the bottom. That, that's still essentially true, except we need to be more careful in terms of how we outreach. Um, I, I wrote an article recently that says always be closing is dead um, because people don't want to be closed anymore. They want to be advised, guided, and helped to make an informed buying decision, particularly when we're talking about B2B sales, something a bit more expensive, something a bit more complicated. And and um, and so ambushing people with a sales pitch is basically per se. So uh, I heard a great term the other day, and it's called pitch slapping, with a P, pitch slapping. <laughs> And, and that is when, when, when people um, uh, link up to you on LinkedIn and say, hey, Steve, we've got so many contacts in common, let's connect. Yeah? And you go, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll connect. And then they go, bang, yeah, buy my stuff. Right? That's, that's pitch slapping. So people don't want to be pitch slapped anymore. They don't want to be spammed anymore. They don't want to have received cold calls um, from people who have no idea whether they're even in the market to buy the things that, that are being promoted. What, what they really expect now is for reps to have done their homework to know a bit about the the prospect. And I'd like to bring back the term prospect. Everything's a lead now, even if it's a faceless list of uh, of contacts, it's now called a lead. To me, uh, there used to be suspects, which is the list. Then prospects, which which are sort of in the the realm of the the, um, segmentation that we're looking at, our our ideal target audience. And then they turn into leads when they're qualified to some degree, right? Now, now all of a sudden, everything's called leads simply because there's list pe- people that sell lists and there's marketers that use their marketing automation to just spam everybody because they think the more the merrier. And, and, and so what I'm saying is that I used to work for you in 2018 and 19 and every bit of research that you look at shows you that it doesn't work any longer. You've really got to change your game. And, and uh, I guess... I- why is it that those older methodologies aren't working and, uh, and the techniques no longer work? What, and, and what should people be doing today instead? Okay. So the, the main thing that's changed is people's is buyers' attitudes, right? They, they didn't like to be pitch slapped in 2018 either, don't get me wrong. But sellers got away with it because the economy was good and people were buying anyway. And, and, and you know, the, the, the more the merrier was kind of the, the easy way out because the technology allowed you to spam, you know, 10,000, 100,000 people and hoping that, you know, a handful might be interested. And, and let's face it, we, we used to be proud of ourselves when we got a, a, a 2% click-through rate, right? <laughs> you know, 98%, you know, I, I always say that, you know, what happens to the 98% that didn't click? You know, were they enchanted by your emails? Were they really happy with your cold calls? Were they okay with your pitch slapping? Probably not, you know, so, so stop it. You're just ruining it for everybody else. 
because buyers will go, I, I've had enough of, of being being spammed, go away. No matter what you're selling, I'm not interested, right? And that, that, that attitude that we're creating collectively as sellers actually ruins it for every other seller. So, so let's not do that anymore, right? So what should people do instead? I, uh, I promote that you have a sales funnel, so a sales process, you know, leads in the top, pass them on to mark, from marketing to sales, so, um, nurture them, and then a, a sale will drop out the bottom. That we stop looking at that from how we want to sell and how we want to measure progress in sales and uh, having a deadline at the end of the, of the month, you know, which is arbitrary and we've trained our buyers to wait for the end of the month or the end of the quarter because they know they're going to get a big discount. <laughs> <laughs> if only they buy from us at that time, you know, which is just crazy. And just turn around and say, what does our sales funnel actually look like from the buyer's perspective, right? And, and there's one other interesting thing, Steve. When, when do you think was the, the traditional sales funnel invented? What year? What, what decade? What century? <laughs> um, wow, I would guess a long time ago, maybe... Uh... I mean, I, I think sales started modernizing probably in the early 20th century. So I'd say late 19th century, or early 20th century. Yeah, actually, you're, you're spot on. 1898. <laughs> well, that's not, a long time. <laughs> not, not, not 1998, 1898, right? I, it makes sense, the, yeah. Long before, before and it was uh, invented by an American, of course, right? Um, and, and it was a good thing because it helped people to standardize their sales processes. And, and, but it was a time when, when buyers needed to be, uh, when the sellers had all the information and, and they needed to give the buyers all the information and, and, and make a sale that way. And that, that's how Always Be Closing came in because they said, you know, right from the start, let's see if they're interested, let's see if they're buying and how, how can we shorten the sales cycle, right? That, that, all that was 120 odd years old. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so, so ironically, we're now using technology to reinforce a 120-year-old selling model, right? So, so what I'm saying is stop that, yeah? Think about who you're selling to, not what you're selling, and focus on, on the customer, what's in it for them, and how they want to buy. And what can you do if you want to... Uh, really generate a lot of growth at your company. What what are the strategies that you should employ if you if you want to grow and you but you also want to be buyer focused in this way? Okay, so the I, I wrote a an article. No, I actually had a webcast um, earlier this month uh, on Bright Talk. So people can look it up there. Called "Opening Is the New Closing," and what what uh, what I mean by that is that. It's, we, we, we probably know who our ideal customers are. We probably know where, where we can find them, where they hang out and how, to, how we, and we can find, we, we can get to them. The technology allows us to get to them. The platforms, LinkedIn allows us to get to them, right? So it's really easy to reach your ideal buyer, but the hardest thing is to actually get them engaged into a sales or business conversation, right? Particularly in B2B, particularly when you're, when you're talking about something a bit more, um, you know, an expensive product or service or, or um, even a, um, a solution that uh, will tie them up with you in, into a multi-year relationship, such, such as an IT outsourcing contract or something like that, right? So, so people want to be engaged. They don't want to be ambushed. So the, so the key is that um, sellers now have to find a way to engage with their ideal customers and, and to create what I call the lean forward moment. And the lean forward moment is when they say something intriguing and the buyer leans forward and says, oh, Steve, tell me more about that. That sounds really interesting. So you got to create that lean forward moment, right? Now, how do you do that? And, and that's really the, the $64 million question. And, that, and, and you do that by giving them some insight, some information uh, that they didn't have before, point out an opportunity they weren't aware of or point out a risk that they weren't aware of. We, we don't use the, the, um, we don't use the risk side of things enough, really, right? We always talk, oh, you know, everything will be great if you only buy our product. 
but we, we hardly ever say if you don't buy our product this is what could happen to you you know you gotta you gotta use our stuff as an insurance policy kind of thing yeah right? so, uh, so i think it's very powerful to show people here's what you would get, get people to agree yeah this is that i would lose that if i don't do this or i yeah. i i i, I in taking a risk that this happens if I don't do this. And, you know, I, I do think fear, fear is a great motivator for humans, right? Um, that's, uh, it, it's, it's, kind of, it's hard depends, wired. It, it kind of depends a little bit, Steve. The, um, the thing is that the more senior the person is that you're talking to, the more they are open to talking about risk, right? Because that, that's just their nature because they they understand risk and they understand that they need to mitigate it. If they're if they're quite junior, they go, ah, oh, it's not my problem. Right? If they if they're a small business owner, they'd rather talk about what's in it for me than how can I avoid risk, just psychologically speaking, right? So so you need to be mindful of who you're talking to as well. But but uh, in my I've got a six week, a ten week, and a twenty week program to help people build their um, entire sales uh, buyer focused sales funnel specifically for their organization, including how to reach out and how to engage with people. And in one of the modules, I talk about how you can create an unfair advantage for yourself and fend off your competitors by talking about something that they will avoid talking about. And that is risk, right? And there's a very simple technique that I, that I teach my clients, and I'm happy to share it with you if you like, Steve. Sure, yeah. And, and, I, and, I, and I get my, my clients to say words along these lines. So these are my words that people have to turn them into their own language so that it sounds completely natural. But but it would be like, like this, Steve. Would you agree that in every business decision that you make, there's an element of risk involved? Absolutely, yeah, for sure. Okay, so then um, you're looking at several vendors to, to provide you with the service. Would you like to know what the risks that you are exposing yourself to in making this decision, regardless of whether you go with us or anybody else? Absolutely, how do I do that? Okay, well, look, let me, then would, would you be okay if I tell you how, well, these are the risks, so blah, 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 three risks. The main risk that applies to everybody is you spend your money and you don't get what you pay for, right? That's universal. And then there's other risks specific to the product or service that you're selling. So you, 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 line, you align, you outline three risks. And then you say, now, Steve, Understanding now that you, we understand the risks, would you like to know how we at blah, 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 at our company, help you help our clients to mitigate those risks? Yeah, that'd be great to hear about. Okay, so then you say how you mitigate those, those risks. Well, you say, look, we have a, a specific quality assurance process. You get a, a money back guarantee. You can talk to any one of our testimonial clients. You can, uh, you, you know, here's some case studies. You know, and you say, look, this is how we make sure that you're comfortable buying from us, right? Because in the modern selling, you actually need to guide your client or your, your, your prospect or your customer to making an informed buying decision, to making what they perceive as an informed buying decision to buy from you, right? And, and with that little technique, what happens psychologically speaking is that you're putting yourself on the same side as, as your buyer. Right? You're saying, look, Mr. Buyer, Mrs. Buyer, there's, there's a dangerous world out there. Nobody else has talked to you about the dangers. Um, I'm, I'm on your side. I want to make sure that uh, you're aware of these things. Right? And the buyer will go, well, hang on. Steve's told me all these things and nobody else has said it. Everybody else says, oh, nothing to see here. We're safe as houses. You know, no, no risk. Go away. Right? Whereas we're the only ones that bring that up uh, proactively. And, and, and all of a sudden, <clears throat> just through this little technique, we've made ourselves a trusted advisor. So I, I teach my clients 10 of these, these techniques uh, and, and build out their buyer-focused buy sales funnel so that they can sell more faster. One, it's not just that you're a trusted advisor, you're also showing them how to mitigate those risks, right? And, yeah. and, uh, and I, I've trained my, now, as you said that, I was like, oh, you know, I kind of trained my sales team to do something kind of like this. Um, but I really like the way you've laid it out. I, uh, I may bring this back up with them uh, in our next group meeting here, just because I really like what you've done here. The, the, so what we, you know, one of the, one of the big risks whenever you're buying software is that the software doesn't work or even more commonly works in a vacuum, but doesn't work with 
your system and uh, yeah, or, it's, or it's hard to use or um it's glitchy and there's no support and you know, the support comes out of the philippines or whatever you know so so there's all sorts of risks you can you can line up exactly lots lots of lots of potential risks and challenges and but the, a key one is that it doesn't work at all or doesn't work for you and and so i i, I do like our i do like my, my sales reps to bring that up because i think we have the best software for this for this problem that we solve on the market Oh. But uh, so I do want them to bring up the risk of like, hey, you know, the, the biggest risk here is that software doesn't work or doesn't work for your environment. But then I like them to, to uh, do do that next step too, and, and and mitigate it by being like, and we can take that risk off the table by yeah. setting you up in a free trial, letting you try it out, make yeah. sure that it works with your CRM system and your environment, and that really kills a lot of deals for our competitors because they're they it's it's more we know that we have a better ability to connect to CRM systems than our, some of our competitors do or all of our competitors really. And, and so when we put, when we put that idea out there that, that they should just be, there's, this is a big risk and you can just easily get around this risk by making the vendor connect to the CRM and show it working to you uh, well, in, in your environment. Right. Like the, the other risk with, uh, with SAS is that people pay for the license. They download the, uh, the, the app or the software, and then they don't, simply don't use it. Right. Yeah. So, so, so um, you can actually, if you're talking to somebody senior enough, you, you want to say, look, you want to get your return on, on your investment. You want to get your time to, to pay back quickly, right? So just uh, a risk is that we actually do all the right things and provide you with all the things. And then you, at your end, let yourself down by not using it. So so there's there's several risks, Steve, that, that you could uh, roll out there and, and uh, help them mitigate and make sure that they actually use the stuff they're paying for. Because otherwise, if they pay for it, don't use it, guess who gets the blame? Right. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so and, and, and you know, um, and one other thing, the senior people really realize that they don't know everything. Yeah, you know? they don't know what they don't know. And if somebody can point out to them something that they're not aware of, or, or um, an opportunity that they weren't aware that they had, or a risk that they weren't aware of, that that then makes them go, "Wow, this guy is really adding value to me." You know, so so make yourself the expert. And make yourself the trusted advisor by simply being smart about uh, what you sell and how you sell. Well, we we uh, you know we're talking about the the how to sell more with a buyer focused sales funnel. Tell me about what are the stages of the buyer focused sales funnel, and how is that different than a traditional sales funnel that people are more familiar with seeing? Interesting. So so look, we we discussed that the traditional sales funnel is now 123 years old. And, and it was a brilliant model when it, when it uh, started out, right? Because you, we, we put leads into the top, they go they get nurtured, um, presumably by marketing, then get qualified, they get handed over to sales, sales advances the deal, and, uh, and, and then a deal drops out the bottom and we get paid, right? Wonderful. Now, how much of all that was about the customer? Did I mention the customer at all? Literally zero. Literally zero. So, so the traditional sales funnel is all about how we want to sell, right? And we assume that we're, buy, we're guiding a buyer to, towards, um, or, or we're manipulating a buyer towards a sale, right? And, and the mantra used to be always be closing ABC, right? We, we know that that doesn't work anymore. I, I think every one of your listeners will have experienced that um, that model is being resisted by most buyers and they're having a hard time achieving that their sales of, um, targets and their quotas, right? Well, I, I think that's been going on for a long time, hence the, the rise yeah. of consultative sell, selling in general, right? Well, look, there, there's there's all sorts of sales techniques that, that came out, um, you know, the challenger sale, the provocative sale, the um, uh, the uh, spin selling, it was a spin selling a long time ago, of course, then, um, you know, that's Sandler and, and everybody, that they're, they're, they're all good techniques uh, and, and they're all actually quite similar. Um, because we're still dealing with people buying from people, right? So the, the, the people um, aspect is something that we, we mustn't overlook. But you asked me about the biofocused sales funnel. So, so what, what I've done is I said, okay, if we take the traditional model that looks inwardly at how we want to sell and measures inwardly how we want to um, approach our customers and, and, and how we want to deal with them, if we take that and turn it around and say, what does it actually look like from the buyer's perspective, right? What does the buyer see? So, so firstly, we, we know that the buyer does their homework before they even talk to a vendor, 
right? That that we know that uh, you know sixty seven percent of the buying process is completed before they contact a, a vendor, right? And and they will go on the internet and they will uh, um, inform themselves. And then they will choose who, which three they will reach out to, which three vendors they will reach out to and, and decide who they want to talk to. So if you're not one of those three, you never knew the deal even existed, right? So, so we need to be out there and we need to be visible and we need to make ourselves seen and we need to have inbound, uh, inbound as well as outbound sales and marketing, okay? So, so no, no problem with that at all. But the, the, the question is then how can we make ourselves one of the three that get shortlisted, right? And then how can we fend off our competitors? How can we win the deal? So the sales stages are, if we accept that buyers will be out there researching their, their choices in terms of vendors, in terms of sellers, then we need to be seen, we need to be visible, and we need to differentiate ourselves from, from the rest. You know, the, the, the famous purple cow in the field of brown cows. You know, oh, there's a purple cow, let's talk to that one, right? So the, I've, I say there's 10 stages in the, in the biofocused sales funnel, and they're not all in the realm of sales, sales they're also in the realm of marketing. Sure. Because, because I've, you know, I'm, I'm holding up my book for those people on the, on the podcast. It's called Marketing Sell Smarter, Not Harder. And it's talking about how we can get more from existing resources simply by getting them to work better together, right? So that's, that's another subject we can talk about another time. But the 10 stages of the sales funnel are, if the buyer has never heard of us before, or even if they have heard of us before, but they go, should, should I make them one of my, should I make this seller one of my um, shortlist of three? Then at the very first point of contact, you want to convey to them what customer experience they can expect doing from us, um, doing business with us, right? I'm not talking about value propositions uh, and I'm not talking about your logo or your, or your, your, your brand. I'm talking about your brand promise. Right. So let me give you an example. Um, there's a North American client of mine that, um, that is in a B2B services space and they, they provide advisory services. Right? And we, we were thinking for a long time, what could their tagline be that makes the buyers, potential buyers aware of what they can expect from this vendor. Right. And, and we decided not to use a tagline we decided to have a three word slogan, right? And, and, and the, the, the three word slogan was competent, fast results, right? And, and so what, what does that conjure up in your mind state when you hear competent, fast results? <laughs> I, I kind of, the first thing that comes to my mind is pick two. It's going to be hard to find all three in a vendor. <laughs> But that maybe I'm a cynic. <laughs> well, 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 maybe, but but if but but if if you go yes, I definitely I want to deal with somebody competent, right? I don't want to wait forever for the for for something to happen, and I want results. Tick tick tick, right? So so now that that gives me an impression of what I can expect from that vendor, right? Mm -hmm. And then when they go on your website, you you must so this is number two, you you must be very clear about what you're selling. Yeah. You know? It's it's phenomenal to me that that people go oh yeah we're selling we're selling you something call us to find out what it is. <laughs> yeah. That's that's always really gotten under my skin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and, and the, the problem is that people are hesitant to ring you because they feel dumb not knowing what you're selling and they don't want to ask you right. So just make it really easy to for people to buy from you. Just be very clear about what what your products are. If if you have a service productize your service, right? So I've got a, a six week, a 10 week or a 20 week program that will give you um, a certain outcome within a certain period of time at a certain price, right? It's much easier for a buyer to say, yeah, I want, I want that than if you say, oh, you know, let's, let's, um, let's just start with an hourly rate and then we see how we go sort of three months later, right? It's, it's just too risky. So mitigate the risk by making very clear what they're buying. Number three, you need to have a value proposition. Right? And the value proposition mustn't be about you. You can't say, um, you know, we're the biggest, we're the, we're the best, you know, we really care about our customers. You know? <laughs> our, our value is all of our features. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so what, what I say is 
don't talk about yourself, talk about what's in, for you, what in it for your customers, right? So, and, and I, I teach my clients to, to start their value proposition with not we do this and we have that. I call that we, we syndrome when people do that. And, you know, actually, every one of your listeners, have a look at your own website and, and see what word the first um, word in every paragraph starts with. If it's your company name, um, we, or our technology or our services do this, you suffer from we, we syndrome, right? Everybody's doing we, 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 and nobody, and none of your buyers care because they want to know what's in it for them. They don't care about who you are and what you do, right? So we must make it clear what's in it for them. So I teach my clients to, to start the sentence off with our clients tell us that this is what they're getting from us, right? Because if you start the sentence off with our clients tell us, then it kind of forces you to talk about what they're getting and not, not what you do. Right? If, you, if, if that's too hard, I've got another way. And that is to say, we do this, but then you append that with, so that our customers get this other thing, right? So always talk about the customer outcome that you're delivering. And then you need to have a killer introduction line, as I call it. And, and that is one thing that you say to a new prospect, this is for your, for your outbound activities, that doesn't sell but that just intrigues. You want to create that lean forward moment where they go, oh, Steve, that sounds really interesting. Tell me more about that, right? So, the, so at the first point of contact, this is bringing us back to a point we made earlier, sellers need to engage with the buyer, not ambush them, right? And by engage, I mean intrigue them with something that makes them lean forward and ask, ask for more information, right? And, and the key to this is that once they ask about, you know, to tell you more, how does it work in my business? You know, how long does it take to implement? Uh, where have you done it elsewhere? You know, at that very moment, when they ask you a question, that's when they, they've given you their explicit permission to sell to them, not before, right? So we must solicit out of them that permission to sell. And we do that by intriguing, not by ambushing with sales. So I teach my clients, what is that killer introduction line that they can use on their first point of contact? How can they intrigue and not ambush the customer at the first outreach? How can they engage with their ideal buyers and not ambush them, right? So that, that was number, number three. Number four <clears throat> is know who your ideal clients are, right? And it sounds really simple, but it's, it's fascinating to me how few organizations, how few sellers actually have that, have perfected that. Right. So when, when you, when you say you, you're selling a, a widget and you're selling it to mid market companies on the West coast in the, um, it space, right? So you've segmented your, your the, the, um, the market. You then went to further to, to drill further down on that. You want to say, well, if we reach out to mid market organization on the West coast, that's in the, in the it space, who in the organization do we want to talk to? Ah, oh, we might want to talk to the CFO. We might want to talk to the CTO. We might want to talk to the CIO, maybe the CEO, you know. But if you think about it, each one of those people will probably form a committee to decide whether they're going to buy your thing or, or whether they're going to buy it from somebody else or whether they're not going to buy it at all, right? There's, it's, there's now committee decisions all over the place. I think it was... Um, um, corporate executive board that CEB that said there's now 6.8 people involved in a committee to make a, 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 a complex buying decision, a, a buying decision for a complex um, sale, right? So you, when you reach out to them, you must actually intrigue each of them individually, right? So how do you intrigue them? Well, you intrigue them with the things that they care about because the, the CFO will look at everything from a finance lens. They will go, what's the internal rate of return? What's the... ROI, what's the time to payback, for example, right? The, the, the techno person, like the CTO or CIO, will want to know what's the support like? You know, is the product stable? Is it going to give me problems? Because I don't want any more problems. I've got enough problems. Just, uh, um, you know, what, um, what, what's all that like? Will I sleep at night? The, um, the, the user buyer might say, well, is it easy to use? Um, is it a steep uh, learning curve? Will I have to climb up? You know, will it be super difficult for me to actually use this thing? You know, so, so, and so on and so on. So you can see how there's multiple people looking at the same thing with, from a different perspective. 
and as sellers, we must be mindful of what does this particular person care about, right? So we must have an answer for the CFO, we must have an answer for the CIO or the CTO or for the buyer, so that when they come together as a committee and decide who they want to go with, they go, oh, Steve ticks my box. Oh, Steve ticks my box too. Oh, that's funny. Steve ticks my box too. It becomes a no-brainer. Let's buy from Steve, right? So, so it means we need to do our homework. We need to be prepared. We know, need to know who our ideal customers are, what they look like, what personas they have, what they care for, where they hang out, and how to engage them so we can create that lean forward moment in each one of them. So when they come together as a committee, they want to buy from us. Okay. So then we go on to <clears throat> we go on to fending off our competitors. And we've talked about bringing up proactively bringing up the matter of risk, making everybody look like they're dangerous because they didn't mention risk and we're the only safe one because we did. Then let, then, the, then the buyer will say, okay, Steve sent me a proposal, right? What, what, um, what's very tempting for sellers to do when somebody says, send me a proposal? Send them a proposal. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, and, and I say that's the most dangerous thing you can do, right? Because what happens once you've sent off the proposal? It gets emailed around and nothing happens. So the, the, the buyer, the sender, the, the seller has lost control of the sale, right? You, you've, you've opened the kimono, you know, you've, 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 you've exposed all your pricing and the T's and C's and, and, and everything, and it's now up to the buyer to decide whether they want to talk to you again or not. Right? In the meanwhile, the seller gets very nervous, right? Oh, I haven't heard from them in two weeks now, and, you know, have they even read the proposal? Have they looked at it? Have they already decided and not told me? Are they going with somebody else? You know, what the hell's going on? And, and we become nervous, and, and, and we, we want to follow up. Right? And we, we all sound a bit desperate and we go, <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 else, what else can I do? What else can I do with you, right? Um, so, so I teach my clients a very simple technique that actually um, one of my West Coast clients um, got a multi-million dollar deal out of just, just by using that little technique. Do, do you want me to tell you about that one? I do. <laughs> okay. I love multi. I mean, just just to be clear, I love multi-million dollar deals. I think they're great. So tell us the tell us the secrets. That's that's it depends whether you're buying or selling, Steve, doesn't it? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, for, fortunately for me, I I, uh, I don't do multi-million dollar deals where I'm doing the buying, but just the selling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just the not yet. Not yet. <laughs> yeah, no. All right. So he, here's the technique that I teach my clients. Um, it's surprisingly simple, but it it works a treat. When the buyer says, Steve, can you send me a proposal? I teach Steve to say, yep, Mr. Buyer, that's, that's great. I'd love to send you a proposal. We, we pride ourselves on making sure that um, our proposals meet, your, meet with your requirements. Therefore, would it be okay if we get together on Thursday at 2 p.m. next week to go through a draft together to make sure that everything is, is as you want it? Okay, so what have I done here? I've said to the buyer, we really care that, that we hit the mark for you. We want to make sure that you get value. So therefore, can you help us write this proposal? Now, we didn't say that out loud, but that's what we've done here, right? Now, the buyer, of course, has two choices. They can either say, yep, yeah, Steve, that's fine. Let's meet at 2 p.m. on Thursday and we'll go through it together. Or they can say, nah. Steve, not interested, just send it through the way it is. Okay. If they say, send it through the way it is, what does that say to you? Well, probably you're a straw man in a deal that's already been decided for someone else. Yeah. So you get Intel without even, <laughs> without even, you know, cheap, cheap Intel, right? Um, let's, let's revisit that in, uh, in a minute. If the buyer says, yeah, let's, let's meet at 2 p.m. on Thursday and go through the, the draft to make sure that it, uh, it's everything we want it to be. What does that tell you? That tells me that that's likely my sponsor at the organization and they need, they know that this is a key document for them to go sell it internally. And, and, and you, you're in the running for, for the deal, right? Right, you, right. You've you got a proper chance, right? 
So, so my client used this technique with, uh, with an existing client, mind you, right? And, and, but this was a multi-million dollar project. So the client said, look, um, we've, uh, we've got another project for you. Can you send us a proposal? And they thought, look, we've done business with these guys before. Um, you know, they'll, they'll know what we need, so just send us a proposal. But my client said, look, it's very important to us that we, so this is a big deal for you, Mr. Client. So it's very important to us that, that we, we get it absolutely right for you and make sure that you can make an informed decision. So would it be okay to go through the, the draft together? Right? Because this was a multi-million dollar deal, the client brought their entire executive team to this meeting. All the decision makers, that whole committee, they spent two hours going through the proposal almost line by line. And at the end, everybody had invested so much time, effort, and, and, their, and their, personal, um, their personal energy into it that they weren't even gonna look at any, any other vendor, right? Plus the proposal was not perfect because, because it's been tested on the customer, right? So guess what? They they won the multi-million dollar project because they left themselves as the only only um, vendor running and only vendor standing, uh, simply because they said to the customer, "We care and we want uh, to make sure that it hits your mark." Right? Can you help us? Right? So back to the other scenario where the, if the if the customer says, "No, nah, Steve, just send it through," okay, you you have two choices as a seller when that happens. One is, of course, you can send it through, cross your fingers, and then hear crickets. The other one is very risky, right? But, but if you think we're not going to get this deal, we're just making up the numbers here, and it's, uh, it's no, um, no point sending the proposal through, instead of just walking away and saying we're not sending it through, you could actually say, no, Mr. Customer, we pride ourselves on the fact that we, we provide proposals that really suit, that really meet our, our customers' requirements. And therefore, we'll, um, we'll, um, we'll insist that you help us with this, um, um, with this um, proposal, right? But of course, you don't say that. Here's what you do instead. You send the proposal through, but you have no signatures on it. You have no time. Um, time bombing on it, you take out all the pricing and you write draft right across it in big watermark letters and you send it through. Right? What will happen? They'll get back to you and want to be more specific. They say, well, there's no pricing in here, what's going on? You know? And, and, and that's when you get another chance to say, ah, oh, but that's because, Mr. Customer, there's no point putting pricing to something that we're not sure is actually right for you. You know, so therefore, would it be okay if we got together a Thursday at three o'clock to um to go through the draft together and make sure that it suits you? Because then we can put pricing to it. It's risky, it's cheeky, right? But if you think you're just in there to make up to make up the numbers, then it's no point exposing all your pricing and, and all your T's and C's and everything to the vendor to the buyer, and you might get yourself a second bite of the same cherry simply by them going, "Oh wow, these guys really do care." You know, now well, I am interested in them after all. So you need to be judicious in terms of which, which way you go. But that's how I teach my clients to use the proposal process. Don't get me wrong, the content of the proposal is very important, but use the proposal process to give yourself an unfair advantage. Very smart. Very, very smart. All right, let me finish with the last two points very quickly. So the last two points then are, how can we create such a good pre, during, and post buying experience that the customer will come back to us for more, right? And, and I teach my clients um, seven techniques to, to do that so that um, the buyer says, I got such a great experience from you guys, I'm gonna buy some more from you, right? Because we know that it's, it's much harder, I think between seven and 10 times harder to find a new client than to just get um, a repeat purchase from an existing client, right? Last point is how can we not only create happy clients, but how can we turn them into champions and advocates for our business as well and get them to refer more business to us, right? right. So, I, so in, in, in my programs, I, I teach my clients how they can get referral business by knowing who to ask, when to ask, how to ask for referrals, right? And, and there's quite simple techniques there, but you need to get, it, get that right, yeah, because 
because if I if I ambush you, <coughs> pardon me, if I ambush you and, and say, Steve, give me a referral, you're gonna you're gonna say, well, who the hell do you think you are, right? But if 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 I can teach you when it's the right time, when it's the right person, and, and what's the right way to ask, that um, that almost guarantees you success. Then uh, that's that's really gold for any seller out there. So those are the 10 points in the biofocus sales funnel. And like I said, I've got three programs, a six week, a 10 week and a 20 week program to help you build that funnel for your organization, for you specifically, to embed it into your organization so you can use it for your outbound sales activities and for your inbound marketing efforts. And also in the 20 week program, I go one step further and actually help you with, with personal advice and guidance in terms of how to apply the biofocus sales funnel to a specific buying opportunity maybe some lighthouse account or some customer that you've always wanted, but never quite got, uh, I'll help you get in there. Very cool. Very, very cool. And do you, do you, I guess first, why is it important for salespeople to have a, uh, I think you called it a unique selling proposition and, mm -hmm. and uh, how does that, how does that relate to the clear brand, uh, clear brand promise that you talked ah. about? Okay, excellent question. Thank you. So, so the, the, the brand promise is about not what we do, it's about how we do things and how it makes the buyer feel that we do things. So as a buyer, I want to know what, what is it like dealing with Steve, right? Particularly when we're talking about uh, something longer term, like a three to five year IT outsourcing contract, right? Because what I'm buying is not a service, what I'm buying is actually a relationship. So I want to know what Steve's going to be like as a, as a business partner, right? Um, is he going to let me down? Is he going to keep his promises? Is he, is he going to um, um, hit and run, you know, once, once, uh, once uh, he's done the sale and we're never going to hear from Steve again, right? But, so they want to know how am I going to be treated as a customer? And that's your brand promise. What will I do for you and what's in it for you, Mr. Customer? That's your value proposition. Makes a ton of sense. Um, well, the next section is sales in 60 seconds. That's quick questions, quick answers. So yeah. ready. First, uh, first question, what's the most important characteristic needed to become successful in sales today? Be sympathetic to the buyer. Put yourself into their shoes, position yourself on their side. And give them the impression that you're helping them and you're guiding them and you're educating them in making an, uh, an informed buying decision. And what are your top tips for fending off competitors? Well, like we talked about uh, bringing up the matter of risk pro proactively, right? That's, uh, that, that's a good one. Never, never badmouth your competitors. Right? In fact, you, you should say, look, um, I hear great things about them um except that, yeah, that we do this you know don't say they don't do that say you do something that they don't do and you know we all know how important sales training is or else we, we wouldn't be listening to this podcast and um sharpening the sword uh keeping up with the 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 latest and greatest best practices what is your best tip to um, learn the new best practices around for sales and retain the information once you're exposed to it so that you can really apply what you've learned in your practice. Yeah. Okay. Look, look, uh, I've, I, I cringed a little bit when you said sales training uh, uh, and here's why <laughs> I, I, I am deeply against people being, being stuck into a room for three days, being filled up with new selling techniques and then being patted on the back and led off into the field and saying, now apply it, right? There, there's a, a German psychologist uh, that lived in the um, 1800s called Hermann Ebbinghaus. He stipulated the, the forgetting curve. And he's basically said that 80% of what you've learned will be forgotten within 30 days if, if, it's, not, if it's not being reinforced, right? So, so sales training by itself is completely useless. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of money, right? Unless it is followed up by sales coaching by bedding in the learnings into the into practice in the field, right? So I'm, I'm a very strong advocate of having sales training, any sort of training, right? 
followed up by coaching so you can actually apply it in, in, in real life, right? So that's so that's that's my little soapbox <clears throat> moment there. I'll step off the soapbox now. But but the um, the other thing I, I recommend sellers to do is whatever sales training they receive, make it make it sound completely natural when you when you use it. You let let it in, interact with your own personality, with your own style, and the way you do things. So it doesn't sound like robotic and just learn and I'm, I'm just applying their learning, right? But 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 you know people buy from people. So if if you if you have a sales technique, make it sound natural, make it sound completely um, authentic. Don't give the buyer the impression that you're manipulating them into a purchase, right? Buyers are not stupid. They they know when they're being being played. Don't give them the impression you're playing them. You know, don't don't try your your, your cool. Uh, assumptive clothes or anything like that, right? I, uh, the reason I called the the, the um, podcast that the um, webinar that I did opening is the new closing is because what, once you open well and you gain a bit of rapport and, and even perhaps trust, the closing will take care of itself. So don't don't push for the close; just guide the buyer there. But it's okay to ask for the for the sale at the right time. No, no more always be closing. No more ABC. Buyers don't like it. So true. And it's and in, in a complex buying process, it's it's almost always too early to, to always be closing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just lose you just lose respect if you if you try to push for for a close. Yeah. Um and, and what's the greatest sales lesson that you've learned over the years? Look, I've I've um Worked in multinational corporations, both on the on the sales side and on the marketing side, and and the um, the thing that's always astounded me is how little those two functions actually talk to each other, you know, and um, and so that, that's why I wrote the second book <laughs> about this. It's bugged me so much. It's because every single organisation that I come across, um, if they're a certain size, where they have a separate marketing team and a separate uh, sales team, they they always complain about the same thing. Marketing says, oh, the salespeople don't follow up our, our sales leads. You know, we, we create all these great leads and the salespeople just don't follow them up. And the salespeople say, well, the leads are all um, less than useful. I was going to use a stronger word then, but I didn't. Um, <clears throat> are, are less than useful. And we've tried two or three and but nobody wanted to buy. So therefore, we're not listening to sales anymore. So imagine that there's a whole team on one side doing stuff that's totally being ignored by the other side. And, and then the, it, it creates bad blood because everyone is pointing the finger at the other and, and you know, the culture suffers and the collaboration suffers and productivity suffers, suffers right? So I, I teach my, my larger clients um, a way to actually bring those two together and make them both focus on the same thing, which is the customer. And that pretty much forces them to work together and, and to do better. Because if, if sales can help marketing to do a better job for sales, then sales can sell more, right? So sales wins because they sell more. Marketing wins because they get better recognized for a contribution to revenue. And let's not forget the customer wins as well because what they see on the website is the same as what the uh, what the rep tells them when they meet face to face, right? So they, they get a more consistent and more pleasant buying experience as well. So everybody wins, and I, I call it the virtuous cycle of collaboration. It's probably a bit of a grandiose term for guys. Let's just work together. And as an actionable takeaway, what should all of the field sales people listening to today do as a first step towards getting started on uh, following a buyer-focused sales funnel? Okay. Well, look, the, here's a great opportunity for every one of your listeners. It's free. It takes about 10 minutes, but it'll give them a ton of insight, right? I have a, a free sales a buyer-focused sales funnel assessment, uh, self-assessment test on my website at peterstrogop.com, right? And what, what every one of your listeners can do is go on there and fill out a bunch of questions and, and, to, and then get a score in terms of how closely are they aligned to the buyer-focused sales funnel and get a complete list of all the things where they're already doing well and, and where they still have some opportunity for improvement for free. Right, so so you can actually benchmark yourself just in ten minutes 
uh, for free at, uh, at the website. And we will uh, certainly put the website peterstrokeorb.com in the uh, show notes because it's hard to spell. Stroke Orb, that's, that's, that's a, that's a <laughs> tough one. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. That, <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. So, uh, well, well, Peter, where, where can our listeners read more about your work? How can they learn more from you? What's the best way to reach out to you? Look, I, I'm, I'm all over LinkedIn. I've got two LinkedIn groups. I've, uh, I've got a presence on LinkedIn. So just um, reach out to me on LinkedIn, connect to me. Uh, go to peterstrokeorp.com, which is not that difficult to spell, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> and I've, I've, got a, I've got a webinar channel on Bright Talk. I've got a, a YouTube channel. So look, if, if you want to look me up, you can find me. Not that hard to spell, but I'm warning you, there's a silent H. That's got it. <laughs> Don't forget the silent H. <laughs> um, Not many H's are allowed, though, you know? <laughs> that's true. I mean, there's only, it, the good news is there's only one silent H. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'll, buy, I'll buy anyone a beer who, without looking it up, can figure out where that silent H might be. <laughs> and, and by the way, um, just I forgot to mention, my, my two books are available in, in every good Amazon store, right? Um, in, available in, in 13 countries. Fantastic. Um, well, Peter, this has been an absolute uh, joy to learn about the uh, the the buyer focused sales funnel here. Um, this has been a great episode of the Outside Sales Talk. If anyone works in field sales, you'll love Badger Maps. It's the number one route planner that helps you sell twenty percent more, drive twenty percent less. And you can get a free trial at BadgerMapping.com today. If anyone can think of other sales reps out there that would benefit from learning the things that Peter's taught us about here, definitely, you know, share with them and, and forward this episode on to them. Uh, Peter, thanks so much for coming. And I, I really appreciate your time and, and you, you taking the time to teach us this stuff. Uh, thanks, Steve. It's been a pleasure being here. And I hope every one of your sellers will benefit from this talk. Absolutely. Well, take care until next time, everybody. All right. Thanks, Steve. Bye.